Nathan Veltman takes the stand in his own defense. Quebec is floating the idea of jacking tuition fees at English universities to somehow magically protect the French language. The motions package for the NDP is out and there's nothing about Israel or Palestine. And Australians head to the polls to vote on changing their constitution to give Indigenous people more say in government. Good morning. It's Friday, October 13th. That's right, Friday the 13th. I'm Nora and here are your headlines. First to London, where Nathaniel Veltman took the stand in his terrorism trial. He testified in his own defense, and CBC's Kate Dubinsky, who has been following the trial, reported on what he said. Veltman detailed that he had a difficult childhood. His father was quote-unquote passive, and his mother was, he said, a religious fanatic. He was homeschooled, and like the shooter at the Quebec City mosque attack, he was a twin, which, as a twin parent, I've been thinking a lot about. He said his mental health was declining, and he turned to conspiracies and racist quote-unquote garbage, garbage is his word there, to quote, figure out why I was in pain, unquote. He watched the stuff for six or seven hours per day. And he also wrote a racist manifesto, which Dubinsky mentions as a reminder for readers, not that Veltman talked about it. The prosecution finished with their witnesses, and Veltman is the first witness that his defense has called. What isn't clear in the story is what exactly his defense is. That he was messed up, so he couldn't have actually done first-degree murder or terrorism. He claims that he didn't have the truck specifically to murder, and that the upgrades to the truck were so that he could go off-road, and the knives in his car were for self-defense in general. But otherwise, it's hard to see from the article what exactly his defense is. It sounds a lot like what we heard from Alexandre Bissonnette, that he blamed his actions on his life being messed up. But at least in the case of Bissonnette, he pleaded guilty and there was no trial. We learned about him during sentencing. But for some reason, here is Veltman defending himself for not being guilty of first degree murder. (sighs) Anyway, the defense also plans to call a doctor to talk about various trauma related disorders. Still not exactly indicating what the actual defense is here. Next to Quebec, where the government is floating the idea of increasing tuition fees for students who attend English universities in the province. They say that this will, quote, protect the French language, unquote, by, you know, only ensuring that the English aristocrats are the ones who can study here. The article by Joe Lofaro and Olivia O'Malley for CTV Montreal spends the first like 10 paragraphs buying into this frame from the CAC, mentioning that they lost a by-election in Quebec City and that they need to do something to boost their popularity, or suggesting that, like trying to stop the decline of French. The article doesn't actually say whether or not French is declining. There's no statistics about French language being used in the workplace or in public. And the article could very well point out that this measure will literally have zero impact whatsoever on the decline of French at all. I I don't understand how you can report a whole article on this and not actually say, wait a minute, how does higher tuition fees at McGill do anything to protect the French language. And it should be noted that this would only be higher fees for Canadian students outside of Quebec and international students. Increasing fees will just make education more expensive for Ontarians and Americans and students from everywhere else. There aren't too many English universities in Quebec, bishops in Sherbrooke and of course McGill and Concordia. The journalists talk to a rep from Bishops who says he thinks it's a bad idea, and McGill declined to comment until the announcement was actually made. Of course, McGill will probably love it as they race the University of Toronto for their Harvard of the North status. And uh, that's it in the article. No mention at all that this is a smokescreen, like, obviously, just that we trust what the CAC claims will happen and we get reaction. 
It's not exactly journalism, but the good news is the Americans and Ontarians who go to Concordia and McGill will be itching to get into the streets over this one. I do think that this will blow up in the face of François Legault. Next, today the federal NDP starts their convention. If you are going to be there, I hope you have a good time. I wish I were covering it in the way I covered the Conservative convention, but unfortunately, I've been booked since April for this weekend in Toronto, hence why Sandy and I scheduled a live show at the same time. We like to kill two birds with one stone when it comes to our live shows. The motions package has been released, and of the 60 priority motions, none of them reference Palestine or Israel. Maria von Stackelberg with the CBC reports that there were more than 1,000 delegates who voted for the resolutions to come to convention, out of a total of 350. The motions were voted on before Hamas attacked Israel, according to Heather McPherson, who is the party's foreign affair critic. She said that she expects an emergency motion will be served, which is, yes, near certainly something delegates will do. The deadline for emergency resolutions was uh, yesterday. McPherson says this to the CBC, quote, what Israel is doing right now looks very much like collective punishment. I mean, McPherson looks, come on, come on. Anyway, I'll go on. Quote, Israel has every right to defend themselves, but they also have an obligation to live up to international law. People in Gaza, over 50% of them are children. All of us need to be going into our convention thinking about how we support our Jewish, Canadian, and Palestinian Canadian friends and family and community members. How we make sure that Canada is doing everything we can to call for a ceasefire to stop the deaths of innocent civilians, unquote. Here's a tip to McPherson. I'm not sure that you should be thinking about how to support our Jewish, Canadian, and Palestinian Canadian friends, family, and community members. This is an international issue, and this requires international responses. And you're the international affairs critic. The NDP has been pretty pathetic on international affairs for a long time. Maybe, maybe, maybe a crisis could be a moment to talk about international affairs. How communities in Canada, specifically Palestinian and Israeli, are dealing with it is kind of a separate issue from from what is Canada doing about all of this. But anyway, I'm not going to be there. I'm not the one voting on this. Who knows what the emergency motion is going to say. It'll probably say literally what McPherson told CBC because, of course, that's how this stuff happens. It's very manicured. But the motions are listed in the CBC article after the main text. And no offense to the people who wrote these motions, but they feel like model UN. Stuff like, quote, ensure federal health dollars can't be used by provinces to deliver for-profit private health care, unquote. Like, did the NDP never have this one on the books before? What is the point of debating this? What is the point of debating something that will get 97% of support in the room? And the 3% of people who vote against, like, made the mistake on their clicker or, like, were mad that this was taking up any time. One of the other motions says to add dental and pharmacare to public health care, something that is like, you know, very much what the party is saying it's trying to do already. In fact, they're propping Trudeau up to do this. Maybe it's best that I'm not going to be there because... A motions package where the motions will obviously pass with more than 80% support isn't exactly inspiring. And it was tedious enough to watch all of this at the Conservative Convention. So good luck if you're going to be there. And finally, to Australia, where voters are going to be voting tomorrow on whether or not to recognize Indigenous rights in the country's constitution through a new parliamentary advisory board. Hey, NDP, you paying attention to this? Maybe you can debate this as an idea. Okay, I digress. If the yes vote wins, it will create something called the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. That will be comprised of representatives from Indigenous communities to provide independent advice to lawmakers. The communities would select their representatives who would serve for fixed terms. They won't be able to direct or veto policy. They follow similar bodies that have been established by the Sami people in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Here's what people are voting on, quote, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognize the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed altercation? Unquote. Altercation is such a strange word, but anyway, I copied and pasted it. So 
OK Australia. (laughs) Holding this referendum was one of the big promises made by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese when he was elected, reports Al Jazeera. As you might imagine, the campaign has also been rife with racism and abuse, combined with tons of disinformation on social media. And polls put the no vote ahead. The no vote is relying on people being ignorant of everything with their slogan, quote, if you don't know, vote no, unquote. The yes vote needs a majority that is over 50 percent of the population and a majority in at least four of Australia's six states. Australia has mandatory voting, which makes this vote even more interesting. The Indigenous population in Australia totals 980,000 people, which is about 3.8% of the population. In case you don't know this, in Canada, Indigenous people make up 5% of the population. Those are your headlines for Friday, October 13th. I'm Nora. I'm coming to Toronto. In fact, I'm already in the air by the time you're listening to this podcast. That is right. Tomorrow at the Review Cinema, Sandy and I are doing a live show. Tickets, you can get them at the door. They're $35. And we have a very special musical guest. John Camille Farah is going to be playing for us. And you might not know John's music, except you do know John's music because he did the music for the beginning and the end of the Sandy and Nora podcast. Actually, we took one of his songs. He's going to be playing those two songs plus a 30-minute set. Sandy and I are going to talk. We're going to take questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. Four o'clock tomorrow in Toronto at the Review Cinema. Hope to see you there. You are listening to this podcast at sandyandnora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and everywhere you get your podcasts. I hope your Friday the 13th isn't too spooky. I will talk to you on the other side of this weekend.